Hello, this is Pastor David Stewart of Destiny Preparation Church. Welcome you to the program. This is Road to Destiny, brought to you by Destiny Preparation Church. So happy to have you with us here at Destiny Preparation this week. Another great week that the Lord has given us. Finally, finally making our way, crawling our way out of that, that wonderful winter that we had. And spring is amongst us. Hallelujah. Thank God for that. Summer may be here for a week or two, <laughs> coming up in a week or two as well. So thank God, though, for all the seasons, all the things that he does, all the things he gives us. You know, they all have purpose. A lot of times we don't understand it, but they all have purpose. And so we thank God for it. Hope that you are having a great, great spring already. Hope God has been blessing you as he has been blessing us here at Destiny Preparation Church. Man, if you haven't been to service here this year, I want to encourage you. This is a great time to come. Great things have been happening. Church has been growing. People have been excited. People are getting saved. A wonderful, wonderful spirit and atmosphere here. And you are cordially invited to join us. This is Destiny Preparation Church, located in the town of Greece, 1230 Long Pond Road, right around the corner from Greece Ridge Mall in the town of Greece outside of Rochester, New York. If you're watching us on uh, the internet and somewhere from elsewhere from the, in the country or elsewhere in the world, welcome to you, glad to have you tuning in with us. I wanna tell you, you too can connect up with us in a lot of different ways. We have our email access, you can contact us in prayer at Destiny Preparation Church. We also have our, our phone ministry, which is national. Uh, people call in, in for prayer. And our prayer time takes place on Wednesday evenings and Saturday mornings, Eastern Standard Time, Wednesday evenings at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard, Saturday mornings, 8 a.m. We have people calling from other states throughout the country. What a blessing it is. Join us for prayer. Bring your prayer requests as we come together and lift it up before God. We're believing and expecting God to do great things in your life, even as he's doing it here. If you're from the Rochester, Greece area, you're of course invited to join us at any time. If you're a guest traveling through, come and join us anytime in our services here. We meet on Sundays and Wednesdays. Sunday mornings, we meet at 10 a.m. for Sunday school over in the other side of the building in classrooms. We have different classrooms for different age groups. That's at 10 a.m. on Sundays, followed here in the sanctuary at 11.30 a.m. with our morning worship service. And I just want to share, for many of you who watch the program. You may appreciate what you see on the program, but there's nothing like being here. The spirit, the atmosphere, the worship, the power that comes through in the midst of worship, at the end of the service, at the altar call, or sometime in the middle of the service at the altar call. However God leads us, it's a powerful, powerful experience to be here. So I want to encourage you that the Word of God is a great thing and necessary for you, but there's nothing like the atmosphere of being in the house of God. And you need to be part of a church as well. If you're not, if your church is at home, if your church is on television or radio, you are missing something because there's more for you. God has something more for you when you connect up with other people. We call it the body of Christ. And when we come together, that's when things happen that cannot happen by yourself. I want to encourage you. You'll be blessed. Your family will be blessed if you come and connect up here in the body of Christ in the church. We're speaking right now on a series which actually kind of connects all this together. It's called The Perfect Church. I'm sharing it now for the past few weeks. Wow, it's been a real blessing here at the church and here at our church as well. You know, people are looking for the perfect church. Sometimes they say, I'm not going to join unless I find the perfect church. What is the perfect church? How do you define it? What do you base it on? I want you to understand it's not the programs. It's not even, it's not the building. It's, it's not all these other things. It is we, the people, the body of Christ that make it perfect. When we become perfected, the church becomes perfected. And that's part of what this sermon is about today. We're going to do it in two parts this week and next week. It's called the matured church. This talks about what happens when God's people come together, how we are able to fulfill his purpose and his vision for us here on earth. I pray that this will bless you. I pray that you'll stick around, listen to this, and then connect up with us. Don't forget, call us, find us on Facebook, find us on YouTube, send us an email, whatever you got to do, but all, by all means, come to church and be blessed here. God bless you. I look forward to seeing you here real soon. Here we have been sharing over the past several weeks about this image of the perfect church. Amen. Anybody found one yet? <laughs> Still looking. Praise God. Still working on that. One of the things that we talked about over the past couple of weeks 
is it's important for us to realize that the perfect church isn't necessarily a place. Amen. The perfect church is us because we are the church. The perfecting of the church doesn't simply come from perfecting the place. It comes from perfecting us, from us being perfected. And it's not only a, a, an individual thing that needs to be perfected. We need to be perfected as a unit, as a body. You know, I, when I sent out uh, the, the uh, sermon of the week this morning uh, for Facebook, I was struggling a little bit trying to find the right way to describe uh, what that sermon was about. But it ties in to some degree with what we're talking about now, this concept of understanding that everything in the world and everything, even spiritually, is not just about me. Amen? Today we are so focused on self and me that it really hinders us from really doing and being or understanding even or perceiving all of what God really wants for us. This is a self-centered time. We are so self focus, particularly here in the United States where we have so many things, it causes us to be driven and drawn. The whole de democratic system, not saying it's a negative thing, but the whole democratic system focuses on developing me. And that whole aspect of culture pushes us and drives us to be more self-focused than to be focused on the, the larger, the, more, the bigger picture the things that are around us. We need to understand that God is the exact opposite. God is focused on that which is outside of him. The love of God is not, does not point towards him, it points towards us. True love points outward, not inward. It's not about what you do for me, it's about what I can do for you. And so to really understand the mindset and the purpose and the direction of God, we have to learn sometimes to get past the me. What does this do for me? How is this going to bless me? How do I become a better person? Yes, we need to be improved, but there needs to be more of an improvement than just me. There has to be a we. Somebody say we. we. There comes a time, there is a balance, there's a level that we have to understand about the needs of the we. Because there are some things that we can only do when we operate as we. There are a lot of things you can do as me. But there's some things that take a we. There are a lot of achievements that we make in life on our own. But there's some achievements where you got to have somebody in your corner. Somebody backing you up. Somebody supporting you. Somebody helping to lift you up. There, is, there are some things that require we. And spiritually, in the, same, in the same way, there are some things that can only be achieved through we. Last week, we talked about the giftings of the church, and we talked about how all these different gifts are intended to come together, connect up, because they have strength and power in of themselves, but the true picture is painted when they all come together. Like pieces of a puzzle, each piece has its own unique value. It's valuable but it's more valuable to the whole picture than it is in itself. So God has bestowed in each and every one of us value that pours together to make the picture or the image of himself. We need to be developed in what God is doing for us. I want to turn you back to the book of Ephesians today, chapter 4, where we began this a few weeks ago. And I want to take you, if you will, to the next piece of this discussion that's in the book of Ephesians. As you turn there, Ephesians chapter 4, and I'm going to read the New Living Translation in just a moment. We said before that this book talked about and emphasized the unity of the church. The need for us to be unified, to maintain unity, to preserve unity, unity, to guard, to fight for unity. Understand how important, how significant that is. Paul is emphasizing the fact here that you need to be unified. If it means forgiving each other of some faults, if it means looking past some issues that your brother or sister may have, 
if it means having to deal with some things or let some things go, there are times when you may have to, you ha may have to be offended. Sometimes we get offended, that's it, I'm done. Mm -mm, nope, ain't, not, not bothered with that no more. I'm stepping away, backing up, I'm leaving. I'm offended, they offended me. Paul is emphasizing, and, and I, I think it's amazing that he, he kind of concedes the fact that, you know what, these things will happen. A lot of times we're looking for the perfect church. We're looking for that place where nobody's going to offend me, no, not going to be any problems, there's nothing to be joy, joy, everybody's going to be happy, everybody's going to be like me. We got the same personality because we don't say that, but a lot of times that's what we're looking for, people who are like us because we get along with people like us. Like the same things we like, don't like the same things we don't like, I don't like that, that's tacky. Me too, hey, we can hang together. What happens if you like, don't like something and somebody else does? What happens if you like something and somebody else doesn't? I don't know if I can deal with them. Let me go on this side of the church. I'm gonna stay on the left side of the church today. Amen? He says, he concedes the fact that there are going to be issues between us, but we must guard unity. Let's just read it, let's go to it. Ephesians chapter four. Beginning at verse 2, he says, Be humble and gentle, be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults. He acknowledges the fact that we still got faults. Amen? How many of y'all still got faults? Come on, tell the truth. Amen? How many of you know you still got faults? How many of you know people around you still have faults? Thank you, Jesus, right? So he acknowledges, puts it right on the table. He, he understand that, that you're going to have to, at times, look over, look beyond, give allowance for each other's faults, because they're there. Because of your love. Love allows you to look past that, because I'm more focused on what you need than what you did to me. Well, do I need to say that again? I, I'm more focused on what you need than what you did to me. You, you, you hurt me, you talked about me, you lied about me, but it's more important to me that you need help, that, that you need to get stronger, that you need to get better than it is that, that, that you treat me right. See, love that's selfish is, only, well, only, is contingent. It's only going to work when things are working on its behalf. Love of God goes after you even when you're doing everything you can to get away. Come on now, switch, switch the position. What did God do with you? fighting as much as you could to get away from him, God is still dying for you. The love of God it doesn't care that you're mad at him today. God doesn't care that you got an attitude today. God doesn't care that you had some bad situations and you blamed them on him. God doesn't care that you've got problems and you think he's the source of them all. He's still loving you. Amen? Amen. So he says, you, you, gotta, you gotta learn, church, to look beyond the faults of your brother. Yes, they're there. Yes, yes, everybody's got issues. Yes, there are people that are different. Yes, there are people that, that, that may not necessarily gel with you right away. But understand this, because of your love, you have to look past that. Verse 3, always keep yourselves united in the Holy Spirit. Bind yourselves together with peace. We may not be in agreement right now, but through the Holy Spirit, we're still one. We may not see this picture the same way. That's why the Bible says, come and let us reason together. Sometimes we gotta reason some things out because you're seeing it one way, I'm seeing it another. You know, we're trying to figure out what's the right way, the best way. Of course, I want it done my way, you want it done your way, amen. We've gotta to work together. We can't just say, you know what, forget it. You just do your thing. You do your thing over there. You build your snowman over here and I'll build my Snoopy over here. Amen? We have to learn how to work together. And so he encourages them to keep yourself unified. Always keep yourself united in the Holy Spirit. Bind yourself together. There's something about that binding together. You know when you take something, you take a rope or something and you bind it, you wrap something together? He's saying bind yourselves together. Something about when you bind something. If I bind myself to you, even when I'm tired of you, I'm still stuck with you. You done got on my last nerves, but I'm bound to you. Can't go nowhere. Amen. I really want to leave right now, but I'm bound to you. He says, bind yourselves together. He insists here on the, 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 the urgency, the value, the priority of being unified. I got to love you even when I'm mad at you. I got to stick with you even when I'm tired of you. When you have gotten on my last nerves, you know what? I'm breathing, but I'm bound to you. 
Why? Because there are some things that are more important and bigger than me. We have a job to do. Tired of you, but we got a job to do. So come on and get over here and let's do this job. We're bound together. We got to work together. It, we're, the only way we're going to be successful, y'all seen all kind of movie schemes where, you know, two people handcuffed, they done got out of jail and run away, but the only way they can be successful is if they work together. So I may not like you, I may not appreciate you, but you know what? I'm here to work with you. I'm signing up. I'm checking in. I'm not sitting on the sideline just because you're in charge of this situation and you're doing your thing. I am bound to you. Unity is an important aspect, amen, of the church. We have to be unified together. Now, I want to go on from this. I spent a lot more time on that than I, than I expected to today. But I want to go on to that. Understand that along with this unity, it also reminds us that each of us has a unique gift. We learned this in 1 Corinthians last week, chapter 12. He talked about diversity of gifts, all but one spirit. Here in Ephesians, he reminds them again in verse 7. He says, however, he has given each one of us a special gift according to the genera generosity of Christ. Each of us has a unique gift. I'm just, I'm just recalling what we've already talked about to this point. So we all have a gift. We've all been appointed to work and function in the body. We all have something to contribute to the purpose and the work of God. So we've got to stay unified in our giftings so that our giftings can work together. Somebody say work together to achieve what God would have us to do. Now jumping down to verse 12, he talks about the fact that these things are given for a purpose. Now just before that he talks about these specific gifts, apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists, but he says their role is a role of preparation. It's to prepare all of us, somebody say all of us, to function together to do God's work. They're not the only workers. In fact, they're not workers at all. They're like trainers. You know a trainer, when you get trained by somebody, you ever notice the trainers never really do the work? They just tell you what to do. They tell you how to do it. They tell you when you're doing it wrong. Amen, they tell you how to do it right. But they don't do the work. They train you to do the work. In verse 11, he's talking about the trainers, the apostles, the prophets, the teachers, pastors, evangelists. They are trainers that are helping you to get ready to do God's work. Verse 12 talks about the work that is to be done. Their responsibility is to equip, equip God's people to do his work. What is the work? Build up the church, the body of Christ. We have a purpose of being brought together to execute the will of the Father, which is Christ's body. We know that Christ, God's will was executed through Christ. And so as the body of Christ, when we are fulfilling the purpose of the body, we are fulfilling the purpose of God. So we are brought together to do his work and build up the body. We have a job to do and our job is to build the body of Christ on earth. We are to become the body. We are to take our individual pieces of that body and bring them together until we become the body of Christ. Verse 13, he goes on. And let me read verse 13. He says, until, now this is the goal. This is the vision. You got to know where you're trying to go, right? We're building a body and we're working until we achieve something. What are we going to achieve? Verse 13, until we come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's son that we will be, here's the vision, we will be mature and full grown in the Lord, measuring up to the full stature of Christ. Our vision, our objective is to complete the body to fully complete it so that the body of Christ is here and doing the will of God. It's not just enough to be in the same room. That's a start though, amen? It's not just enough to come together, amen? But we have a job to do. We are supposed to be becoming an image of Christ on earth. When we are done, when we have completed our purpose, we will look to the world like Christ. They will look at us and see what Christ looked like. You ever have somebody look at you and say, you look just like your mother? You look just like your father? They see in you an image of somebody who you came for, from. 
We are to be the image of Christ so that when they see the church, how we operate, how we behave, how we respond, how we act, what we do, they're going to see something that reminds them of what God is really like. Because everywhere else they're looking, they're seeing all kind of stuff. They're seeing ways of the world. They're seeing payback. They're seeing revenge. They're seeing eye for eye. They're seeing anger. They're seeing bitterness. They're seeing no hope. They're seeing sorrow. They're seeing people doing their own thing. They're seeing self-centeredness and selfishness. But that's not what they're supposed to see when they see the church. They're supposed to see an image that tells them what God is like. Oh, you mean God's not self-centered? You mean God's not all about himself? Oh, really? You mean God loves me even when I can't love myself? Really? You mean God can do things for me that will change my life, that will give me a hope and a reason to live? Really? When they see us, they're supposed to see the vision of God. Let me, let me want to paraphr- read this for you one more time and, and paraphrase it. Our job is to bring together the church. So we said in verse 12, the body of Christ, until such a point at which unity makes us mature. That's another part of this. We're supposed to become more and more in his image, more and more executing until the the point at which unity, because that's where he started with this, unity will make us mature. The unity that he's been emphasizing, the, the, the oneness of us working together and bringing our gifts and talents together, when we get it right, we will become mature. Maturity ties to being that image, that perfect image of Christ. We're going to become mature. That's what he said. Let me read verse 13 one more time. Verse 13, until we come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's son that we will be mature and full grown. Our unity is going to take us to a place of maturity. The more unified we become in what we do for God, the more mature we're going to become. You see, there's a pathway to maturity, and it starts with our unity. I want you to understand, what what is maturity as a church? What does it mean to be a mature church? What does it mean to, this church is mature. Does it mean old? This building is old? We are full of old people? Does it mean that we're just wise? What what does it mean to be mature? I want you to understand that a mature church, we've been looking for this perfect church. Understand that a perfect church is a mature church. Same thing. When we become perfected as a church, it is because we have matured. We have become mature. So we need to understand what it is to be mature as a church. Now, as a human being, the older we get, supposedly, Hopefully, the older we get, the more mature we become, right? Amen? What does that mean? Supposedly, the older we get, the more mature we become. We become better. We become perfected as we mature. We we, we become a little bit more stable. Sometimes when we're younger, we're high strung. We're, We're in and out. We don't know what to do. We're still learning. We're still trying different things. We're making mistakes. As we become older, we mature. We have wisdom, experience. We learn not to just jump at everything. We learn patience. We learn how to to, to take from our experiences and use them going forward. We become matured. We become perfected through all these things. I love 1 Corinthians 13, and and Paul kind of puts it this way. 1 Corinthians 13, 11, he says, when I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. You understand this difference in how you think and how you speak as a child, right? Some of your your teenagers, some of your young kids will talk to you in a way that that you know you're just not mature yet. You're going to talk to me like that. You're going to say that. Obviously, you're still not, you're still a child. Amen? I heard, I heard, um, um, Steve Harvey this week, I caught a piece of his show, and he was talking to these young, young men. There were two young boys around 14 years old, and they were misbehaving in their mom's house, single, single mom, and they were just acting crazy. They were tearing down doors. They were doing all kind of crazy stuff. I mean, they were acting nuts. Now, young, decent-looking boys, but they were acting out. And he asked them, he says, now, do you consider yourselves to be children, young men, or adults? And they said, well, we, we believe we're, we're young men. And he said, but your, your behaviors, your actions are the actions of children. You're acting like boys. 
He said, because your behavior, the way that you're acting indicates that you are not yet young men. The, the way you're behaving indicates that you are still boys. You see, because if you were matured, you'd be acting different than the way you're acting now. As we become matured, our behaviors, our responses change. Paul said, when I when I was a child, I spake as a child, understood as a child, thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Some of the things I used to do as a child, I ain't got time for that no more. I don't, I don't, I'm not there anymore. I, I've evolved from that. Why? Because I have matured. There is a growth process that matures us over time. As we grow, we are supposed to mature. As we become more mature, we become more stable. We become more effective.